Hi everyone. Today, I'm gonna to talk about building adaptive layouts in Compose. I'll briefly talk about what they are, and then I'm going to go into more detail about why it might seem tricky to implement some adaptive designs in Compose. Finally, I'll do some live coding to bring some of these tips and tricks to life. Let's start with what adaptive layouts are. They don't just stretch as the window size and other conditions change. Content is hidden or shown, and some components are replaced with other ones. Implementing responsive layouts that just stretch is these days mostly straightforward. Instead of fixed sizes, you use a combination of weights, paddings, and containment to get behavior that adjusts reasonably well within small size changes. Implementing adaptive layouts in Compose might seem trickier at first to do well, because swapping components or hiding and showing them requires knowing how to work within Compose's phase system. Let's do a brief refresher of Compose's phases. There are three phases, composition, layout, and drawing, that strictly happen in this order from top to bottom. Composition is where composable calls happen, either for the first time or during recomposition. Layout happens next. This is where the resulting tree of UI elements gets measured and then placed. Drawing is the last step, the result tree of UI elements that actually get rendered to the user. When building adaptive layouts, there are four things that you often want to do in code to get a desired behavior. Unfortunately, these four things are all desirable, but they can't all be true together because of how the compose phases work. The first is first frame correctness. This is when the desired state of your UI is correct on the first frame without needing additional frames to settle to the desired result. The second is changing what's in composition. Due to the desire to swap components entirely, that often looks like changing what composable calls you're making. For example, choosing between rendering a navigation rail or a navigation bar with some logic. The third is local sizing information. Since elements can contain others, this is making choices based on how much space is available at a specific point in the UI hierarchy. And finally, the fourth is avoiding subcomposition, like with subcomposed layout box with constraints. The reason why all four of these can't be true together comes from the phase ordering before. So let's look at each in more detail. To achieve first frame correctness, we can't have any backwards writes, where one phase is depending on state being written from a later phase. In especially bad cases, this can result in infinite recomposition. But even if you're careful to avoid infinite recomposition by having the UI settle into a final state, this will still take more than one frame to occur. So if we want the UI to be correct on the first frame, we can't have any backwards writes. If we can't have backwards writes, then composition can't change based on later phases. We have to make use of what the first composables emit for our UI. The most common case where we want to do this is the third point, local sizing information. Knowing the local sizing information is often very important to achieve some behavior, but since it occurs in the second phase, we can't use it to directly impact the original composition. And finally, being able to avoid some composition is the final desirable quality. Subcomposition is an escape hatch. By delaying some composition, and then that measurement and that placement to the layout phase. This works, but subcomposition can be problematic for performance, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. So based on the phases that Compose works in, we have this rule that all four of these can't be true together. Without using subcomposition, and to achieve first frame correctness, we can't have composition that depends on the local sizing information but a lot of adaptive layouts want to swap components based on how much size is available. So it seems like we're stuck. How do we actually accomplish these layouts? The solution is in these limitations. We can't have all four of these be true together, so we need to figure out a way to make one of these four false instead. So instead of first frame correctness, we could allow the first frame to be wrong. This is the worst option. I'll talk more about why soon, but I'm including it since this might be the first partial solution when working through a problem. Instead of changing composition, we could find a way to keep the same composable content that's being called. Instead of using local sizing information, we can instead use window level sizing information. And finally, we can allow using subcomposition, either with subcomposed layout or with box with constraints. 
Let's start with the worst option, allowing the first frame to be wrong. To illustrate the issues here, let's jump into some example code. In our first example, we have a text and a background that we want to have match the size of the text. To do this, we are saving the size of the text from on text layout into text size, and using that to set the size of the spacer. This seems to work, but if I resize the app, you might notice that there's some flashing when I resize. The reason for this is that the size isn't correct on the first frame. In the first composition, the text size will be zero. And in composition, that will set the size of the spacer to zero. Only when on text layout is run, which happens after the first composition, will text size be updated. And then on the second frame, will the text size be correct? To fix this, we can get rid of this text size layouting and instead replace size with match parent size. This gets the behavior that we want without having the incorrect first frame. In our second example, we can see what happens if many frames are incorrect. In second frame content, we will only place the content after isPlace becomes true. And isPlace will become true once onPlaced runs. This happens after the first composition. Therefore, content will only be shown on the second and later frames. By nesting second frame content multiple times, you can see as I resize the app, that the final done text isn't shown until many frames after the first. That was our first of four options. Let's now take a look at the next, allowing the use of subcomposition. By using box with constraints, which uses subcomposition, we can get the locally available width and height in composition and then change what we compose using those. This works, but there's a performance impact. Because subcomposition runs during the layout phase, all of the work inside is deferred until then. If your entire app is within subcomposition, then this can have a performance impact because you have a much smaller period of time in order to render everything. Like with anything performance related, you need to measure it to be sure, but be aware that this could have a performance or jank impact in your app. The third option is using window level sizing information instead of local sizing information. We can see this in action with the new Material 3 Adaptive Components. Navigation Suite Scaffold shows different navigation UI components based on the current available window size. This is using, underneath the hood, the window size information. And therefore, we can compose different things based on that without running into any of the issues of locally available size. Similarly, for List Detail Pane Scaffold, which either shows a list, a detail, or both, this decision is based on the current available window size, which again doesn't run into the issue of trying to compose different things based on the locally available size. And finally, the most general solution to a layout problem is finding a way to ensure that the same composable content is being called even when we want to change things based on the locally available space. The design we want to implement is the following. We want to display two buttons. If each of them takes at most 50% of the available width, then we want to show them horizontally, side by side, each taking up exactly 50% of the available width. Otherwise, if there isn't room to show them both side by side, then we will show them vertically, stacked one on top of the other. To implement this, we can use a custom layout. We'll render each of the buttons, and we'll give each of them a layout ID that we can reference in a custom measure policy. Using those, we can get the measurable representing each of the buttons. And then using these measurables, we can get the intrinsic width of each of them. The minimum intrinsic width will be the minimum amount of size needed to render the button. We can calculate this without actually having to measure each of the buttons. Whether or not we want to show them horizontally is if both buttons are within half of the available width. If either of the buttons would take more than half the available width, then we need to show them vertically. Using this, we can calculate the parameters that we need to display the buttons. If we are showing them horizontally, then we will modify the constraints to measure each of them to take precisely half of the available width. We can measure each of them and store them in the placeables. The overall height of this layout will be the max of the two button heights 
because we are displaying them side by side horizontally. If we are showing the buttons vertically, then we want each of the buttons to take up the full width. So we can again modify the constraints to have the minimum width be the overall width available to the layout. And again, we can measure each of them with these constraints to get the placeables. Here, the height will be the sum of the two buttons because we're stacking them vertically. Our layout logic will also be dependent on whether they're showing them horizontally or vertically. If we are showing them horizontally, then we will place the primary button at the end and the secondary button at the beginning. Otherwise, if we're placing them vertically, then we will place the primary button on top and the secondary button on the bottom. Putting all this together, we get the behavior that we want where the orientation and layout of the buttons is dependent on how much local available space there is. The design we want to implement here is displaying a block of text and a badge. If there's enough room in the last line of text to display the badge, then we want to display it in line at the very end of the last line. Otherwise, if there isn't enough room in the last line, we want to display the icon at the very end on its own line. To do this, we need to know the local size information since that drives how the text will lay out and wrap. Again, we can use a custom layout to drive this along with a new piece of information, the layout result of the text. Like before, using layout IDs, we can find the measurable for both the text and the badge. And here we can measure them immediately because their measurement doesn't depend on anything else. The text layout result is set as we are measuring the text. So here it is safe to retrieve the new text layout result that we get. Using this, we can calculate the bounding box for the end of the last line. And with a bit of math for left to right and right to left, we can figure out the offset of where the last line ends. Using this and the width of the badge and the available max width available to this layout, we can calculate whether the badge will fit in the last line. Using this, we can then determine the overall width and height of the layout and where to place the badge. The overall width, if we are displaying the badge in the last line, will either be the overall width of the text or the width of the last line plus the width of the badge. Similarly, the height will either be the overall height of the text or it will be the height of the text except for the last line plus the height of the badge. And then the badge placement will just be at the end of the last line. If we aren't displaying the badge in the last line where it needs its own line, then the width and height calculations will be slightly different. Here, the overall width will either be the max width of the text or the width of the badge. And the height will be the sum of the height of the text and the height of the badge. The badge placement here will be a badge width away from the end of the width of the text. And its Y placement will be at the end of the text. Once we have all this calculated, we can then place the text and the badge and we will get the result we want where the badge will be in the last line of text if there's enough room and otherwise it will be on its own line at the very end. For this case, we want to display a block of text with a max number of lines. If there's enough space to display all the text within that max number of lines, then we want to display it. Otherwise, if there isn't enough space, we want to ellipsize the text and then display a button after it that the user can click on to display more. Whether or not we want to show the button depends on the local available size. So it feels like we can't do this without using subcomposition. However, there is a trick here to be able to do this without needing to use some composition by conditionally placing the button or not. Like before, we can use a custom layout here to control exactly what's happening. We will again have a text, and this time we'll have a button that we're going to conditionally place if the text doesn't all fit in the available space. For this text, the direct text that we are rendering here will be transparent, meaning that we're not actually rendering the text directly with the text. Instead, we will draw the text later in the drawing phase. Because the drawing phase happens after the layout phase, anything that we set here from these variables stored up here in the measure policy 
we can use in the drawing phase without running into a backwards write issue. In our custom measure policy, like before, we will find our text and our button and find those measurables and measure them. When we measure the text, we get the full text layout result. If, without ellipsizing, it can all fit. We can then decide whether or not we need to show the button. We need to show the button if the last line would be ellipsized. If we don't need to show the button, then the result is fairly simple. We can just display the text directly using the full text layout result, and we can skip placing the button. This allows us to hide the button without having to recompose if we don't need to show it. If we do need to show the button, we have a bit more work to do. Now, we don't actually want to use the full text layout result because we want to ellipsize the string a bit sooner because the button fills up some of the space. Using the text layout result of the full text and the measurement information of the button, we can cut off the text at an earlier point, again using the layout result bounding box to figure out where exactly we need to cut the text in order to fit into the available space. Using this and the text measurer, we can then create a new text layout result, one that is ellipsized in the appropriate place so that none of the content overlaps with the button. Similar to before, we can use the last line to figure out where exactly the line ends so that we can figure out exactly how much width it takes up and where to place the button. Here, the overall width will just be the max width available to us. And the height will either be the height of the text or the height of the text up to the last line plus the height of the button. And we will place the button, a button width away from the end, and we will place the button at the top of the last line. Here, we place both the text and we place the button. Because we're saving whether or not to show the button and the full text layout result and lip size layout result up here, we can then, in the drawing phase, decide what to draw based on the result of measurement and layout. Putting it all together, we then have a button that's at the very end if the text is lip sized to fit within the max available line size. And if the text can all fit, we don't need to display the button and we can just display all the text instead. So putting everything together, we now have a flowchart for approaching how to build an adaptive layout that is correct on the first frame without needing to use subcomposition. If the decision isn't based on local size information, you can directly use the window size or other state to change what is in composition. If you do need to have local size taken into account, see if there's an appropriate layout primitive that has a built-in behavior that meets your specifications. And if there isn't, then don't be afraid to write a custom layout. This gives you the most control over your layout behavior. And you can use intrinsics, skipping placement, and other tools to achieve a layout that adapts exactly as you want. Thank you very much.